Get the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Hello. Hello. And thank you all for coming to the first of the presentations here at the uh, Ashland Co Senior Center. And thank you very much for the to the Council on Aging for inviting me back this year. Um, uh, I, as you know, my name is Arthur Bergeron. Uh, I'm an elder law attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us there. There's somebody there that does pretty much everything, but this is all that I do is, is elder law. Uh, when I was thinking about presentations for this year, I decided that while I had done more specialized presentations last few years this year, I would try to go back to what folks tend to want to know about, which is kind of like Elder Law 101 and Elder Law 102. Elder Law 101, um, I thought we were doing today, but we're not. We're going to do that actually in the fall. We're, today we're going to do Elder Law 102. Uh, 101 talks about as you're slowing down, so what are the, th the package of things that you may need to have? The basic, what are the documents, what are the, what are the kinds of, what do you want to be thinking about? Elder Law 102 is really about benefits. It's kind of like benefits 101. So what is the totality of the programs which you as seniors uh, may want to take advantage of and may want and may be able to take advantage of it of them and how do you do that so uh, as usual I'm talking about my good friends Frank and Mary uh, and their kids Peter Paul and Mary jr. you've seen them before uh, and you know that they you know they got their they're they're very simple they've been living in their house for a long time their goal is to die and be buried in the backyard and all things being equal if one of them dies I'd like to leave everything to the other and when the two of them die, they'd like everything to get divided up among the three kids. So the question is, if that's their goal, what should they be doing? And the most important thing is number one. I mean, it would be great, as far as they're concerned, is if after they die, their kids get something. But their most important thing is they want to be okay while they're alive. And if at all possible, they want to stay at home. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today has to do with staying at home. So the first question, and, and, and here are their assets. They, they still own their home. It's worth about $300,000. He has an annuity, Frank does, of $170,000. They have, an, or excuse me, he has an IRA worth $170,000. They have an annuity of $100,000. And then they've got savings of about $75,000. So they have total assets, or excuse me, of $80,000. So they have total assets of $650,000. Frank has income of $2,000 a month. 1500 from Social Security and 500 from his pension. Mary has half of Frank's amount, or $750. So they have a, a total income of about $2,750 a month, for around $30,000 a year. Uh, so the question is, in their situation, what can they do to make sure they stay home? Now, as, I've, as you've heard me say before, Everybody, Frank and Mary and just about all my clients, this is their goal. And that's a great goal, and it's great to stay at home. But if you're going to stay at home, you've got to be safe. You've got to make sure while you're at home you're safe. You know, if, if there's a point at which you may want to think about assisted living uh, or think about a situation in which you are safer than you might be at home, or you may want to be changing your home in some ways, in order to make your home safer. So the, the most important thing is preserving and protecting your house. So that's what you want to talk about. Now, as a matter of fact, I know that I have brought, in, in the past years, I brought a wonderful woman named, with, with me named Carol DiRienzo, who has talked about, she is a, she's a nurse and her husband a, is a contractor, and they've talked about, they actually will go through your house if you're older, and for a fee, they'll, they'll kind of, it, it, you'll tell, talk to them about what you're worried about, whether you have any kind of current lim limitations or disabilities or what you're worried about. And they'll actually kind of go room by room with you and say, so, you know, here are the kinds of appliances that you could change. This isn't just about the ramp, you know, in the front. Or here are the adaptations you could make in your house. And, and then, you know, you can figure out whether or not you want to do any of that. But, of course, all of that costs money. And if you're Frank and Mary, you got your house, but you don't have like a huge amount of extra money. You've got 
three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, and you're and, and everything is going okay for you. You're earning thirty thousand dollars a year, so you're doing okay, but you're not like saving a lot. And you know that as you get older, your expenses may go up, and so you're worried about that. So you may not want to be touching that money. So in that case, you may want to be thinking about what you can do to use your house in order to pay for those repairs. And I'm going to talk about a few of those. First, and, and, the, and the, immediately, one of those possibilities is you can get a reverse mortgage. And immediately people go, oh, I hate that idea. That's a reverse mortgage. That means... You know, that's going to have to get paid off when I die. And you're like, I'm like, well, yeah. You know, except that if you want to keep your cash while at the same time fixing up your house, that's not, I just lost the mic. Cindy? Can you still hear me okay? No. 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 I just, Cindy, if she shows up, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to just talk a little bit louder, right? Um, otherwise, if, 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 you, you want to be making sure that you maintain the house well enough so that you can stay at home and live there. So you say to yourself, well, why would I want a reverse mortgage? Well, you really don't unless you need it, you know, unless you need it because you don't have that other amount of cash to take care of things. Well, there was the, but in addition to the reverse mortgage, there is this other program, which actually it's called the Home Modification Program, and it's actually a reverse mortgage that is given to you by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Your tax dollars at work. So let me tell you about that a little bit. So if you are um, over 62 years old, if you have a disability of any kind, and, and these people are very, very generous when they consider what a disability is, like an inability to get around the house or an inability to do something in the house. If you have a disability and there are changes in your house which would help you better live with that disability, then... Um, the state will, I, lo it, it, I lost it, still on, we're trying, she's going to continue to deal with that. Mm, do you want the power, do you want it? You don't. Then, the, then the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts will lend you up to $30,000, right? Now, it's going to work the exact same way, well that's pretty true. It's going to work the exact same way that a reverse mortgage works, which is they'll lend you the money, you don't have to make any monthly payments, the bill is due when you sell the house or when you die. Um, and the interest rate is either zero uh, if you meet an income criterion, or it's 3%. It's really low. And once again, this is and it's up to $30,000 due on death or on the sale of the house. What is the income criterion? Well, uh, it is zero percent if you have a joint income, if you're Frank and Mary and you have a joint income, you're a family of two, of less than $78,800 a year. That's a pretty hefty income. As it happens, it's more than twice Frank and Mary's income. I don't have a lot of clients that are getting regular income that is more than $78,800 a year. So just about everybody I know qualifies for this program. If you make more than that, but not more than $157,000 a year, right? You still qualify, but there's a three, but it's three percent interest, right? So it's a wonderful way to be getting a certain set of, of, of problems taken care of in your house, right? It's really, really, it's, it's wonderful. Um, the administrator of this program is amazingly SMOC, the South Middlesex Opportunity Council. They have their main offices in Framingham. They're around. And they'll, and, and they'll do all the paperwork. And as I say, whenever I talk to people about this program, don't assume, don't say no to yourself on this. Don't assume, if you're otherwise interested in doing some improvements, that you don't qualify. Talk to them. Talk about what your situation is and what your disability is. I'm going to take all the questions at the end. Um, so that's, a pro that's an available program. The second program, of course, is a reverse mortgage. And we're going to talk about reverse mortgages a little bit. Okay? And once again, I never ever recommend reverse mortgages to people if the goal of the reverse mortgage is to basically maintain your lifestyle. You know, you're retiring, your income's going down, but you can't stand it. You can't stand the fact that you're not going to be making the same amount of money. And so you start pulling the money out of the house. That's probably not a good use of that asset because you may need it later on. 
If, on the other hand, you're Frank and Barry and you're getting older and you really want to stay in the house and you don't want to use up your savings, this isn't a bad idea. So, to qualify for a reverse mortgage, you have to be 62 years or older. 62 years old or older. Um, the amount that the bank will give you is based on two factors, not surprisingly, the value of the house and how old you are. The older you are, the greater percentage of the value of the house the bank will give you. Um, and what I always suggest to people is if you're going in this direction, use this as a line of credit. Use the reverse mortgage as a line of credit. Don't take out all the money because, oh, we're going to try this one more time. I love the fact that this is actually happening on live TV. Right? So, so my friend Barbara Chisholm down at Ashland Cable, you know, I'm really trying. I'm really trying to make this, trying to make this work. Um, Use it as a line of credit because if because even though you you've got a reverse mortgage for a hundred or two hundred or three hundred thousand dollars, until you pull out the money, you're not getting in charged any interest on the money that you have not used. So if you just leave the money in there, if you even if you're if, so if you're thinking about doing something like this, say you've got repairs that are thirty thousand or forty thousand or fifty thousand dollars because you're doing big things. Say it's sixty thousand dollars. Say you're putting in an elevator. Elevators, by the way. You will be amazed at how cheap elevators have become. That's one of the things that Carol DiRienzo will tell you or any of the new contractors. That's one of the things that technology has really improved things. So all of you folks that live in that cave, you know, and you said, oh, we've got to abandon the second floor, it may not be true anymore, right? You may want to look at this. So whatever it is that you're using to fix up the house, pull that money out. You probably don't want to pay the closing costs, so pull out enough to pay the closing costs. Leave the rest of it in as a line of credit. So then the question is, how much could you get? And what are those closing costs? Because the biggest reason, the two reasons why people tell me they don't even consider reverse mortgages is one, you know, oh my God, you know, it, it, it's going to keep getting bigger and bigger, you know, and someday it has to get paid off. And you know, that's all true. You know, that's the way, but that's kind of the way it goes. Uh, and by the way, the reverse mortgage amount that you owe doesn't have to keep getting bigger and bigger. The reason why it gets bigger and bigger is because you don't have to pay the monthly interest payments. Whatever you borrow, you don't have to pay the interest payments. Instead, the interest gets added on to the outstanding principal. And that's why that number keeps growing. But you can make those payments if you want to. If you decide that you don't want that reverse mortgage number to keep growing, you can just make the interest payments every month. Don't have to. If you run short, you don't have to, but you don't, and you never have to pay the principal. So, if you were Frank and Mary, and you were 70 years old today, and, oh, as of a month ago, these numbers are one month old, so they're pretty close, and you had that house that was worth $300,000, you would be able to pull out, of oh, the way reverse mortgages now work, it used to be that you could get all the money right away, that's no longer the case. You can get some of the money, more than 50% of it right away, and the rest after a year. If you, um, and, and one other thing about the reverse mortgage, they all, they're all about the same. You know, you see ads for them, um, you hear things on the radio, you see it in the, in the AARP, all these different things, they're all almost exactly the same. And the reason is because the reverse mortgages are all federally insured by the Federal Housing Administration. Um, if, so that if you actually do end up running up a bill that is higher than the value of your house when you die, the bank doesn't take the hit. The bank gets paid by the federal government, whatever they're owed. Because of that, the federal government regulates these a lot, right? Um, so so, so the, the, the rules are always about the same. If you were Frank and Mary and you were 70, you could pull out immediately out of that $300,000 house, $103,000. And, and at the end of a year, you could pull out the rest so that the total you could pull out would be $167,000. As of 30 days ago, the interest rate would be 3.7%, right? About, you know, they, they, they vary a very little bit. Um, they would all be adjustable, but the maximum that it could go up would be 5% over the life of the mortgage. So that the, the, the highest interest rate as of today would be 8% sometime in the future. Um, now, finally, what are the closing costs for that mortgage today for at least one of the companies? The, clo the total closing cost all in is $4,062. That used to be a much higher number, but there are more companies now that have gone into the reverse mortgage business, and so guess what? With competition, the prices have gone down. So that's actually 
that's, you know, for, for this deal, that's not like a gigantic number. It's more than you would pay for a first mortgage. It's more than you would pay if you wouldn't get a line of credit loan from the bank. And people will often say, well, I want to go get a line of credit from the bank. And I'll say, well, okay, except that your interest rate's going to be about the same, and you've got to make that monthly payment. You know, <laughs> if you do it with a regular mortgage at the bank, you've got to make the payment. Otherwise, you've got a problem. Whereas here, you never have to worry about the payment. Same thing, if Frank and Mary were 80 years old, they could immediately get $118,000, and eventually they could get $192,000. And the same, and there would be the same closing costs. So once again, I'm not saying, we, you know, I'm not pushing reverse mortgages if you're just using it as an income supplement. But if you're Frank and Mary, and you want to stay home, but there are some big things you need to do to stay home, like be able to use the second floor, you know, or really be able to adapt the bathroom so that you don't fall, because God forbid, you fall and get and break that hip. You're not going to assisted living after that. You may be heading to a nursing home. You don't know, you know. So you really want to be making sure the house is safe. Finally, finally, the town of Ashland will give you a reverse mortgage, amazingly enough. And, the re and what, what do I mean when I say that? If you are 62 years or older, you're... If you're Frank and Mary, your biggest bill, other than your food bill, is your tax bill, right? Just is, right? I, very, very common that I'll have people say, I just can't afford to stay in the house, I can't afford the taxes, right? And, and, and I'll tell them, well, you know, you really don't have to pay those taxes. Well, then, what do you mean I don't have to pay the taxes? Well, you don't. If you're over 62, um, there, it, it, no matter what your other assets are, and no matter what your house is worth, right, you can, you can get down to the assessor's office, and the, the program is called Chapter 59, Section 5, Clause 41A. Get that, all right? But you don't have to know that. Just tell them that you want to defer the taxes. And you can tell them, I don't want to pay my taxes this year. And this is okay. And, 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 and I want to sign this agreement where, whereby I can defer them. And what are the terms of the deferral? It's a reverse mortgage. You don't have to make any payments until you die or sell the house, and they're going to charge you interest. Now, the, the state law, the section that I just gave you, that created this program said that in, any, in all communities, um, at the, at, there, is a, there is a cap on your income in order to qualify this for, for this program. There's no cap on assets, but there's a cap on income. That's the state number. But communities are allowed to change that number upward up to a certain maximum. In, in, in addition, the interest rate that the communities are, are, can charge can't be higher than that number, 8%, right? But communities are allowed to change that number. Um, as it happens, as it happens, um, I called, or I had my, my paralegal call the assessor's office to say, so what's the deal in, in um, Ashland? I couldn't believe it. Uh, it's terrific. Now, so you want to check with the assessors, because I want to make sure I got that right, but it's my understanding that actually this, this income limit used to be there, that the income limit in Ashland is now $55,000. If you're a couple, that you can earn up to $55,000. The interest rate, well, it's not zero, but it's 4%. So if you're in Ashland, if you have joint, if you're Frank and Mary, and you have joint income of less than $55,000, you can defer all your taxes until you die, and the maximum in, and the interest rates that they would charge you on this year's taxes is four percent, right? If you're just if you're just married, same, same rules apply. I don't I don't believe I believe that the income rule number stays the same, but you want to check with the assessors on that. All the other things continue to apply. So what is it? It's basically just a reverse mortgage, right? It's all the same things. You're simply deferring debt until you die. You're being charged an interest rate. And oh by the way. Because it's Massachusetts, there's a special provision in the, in the tax deferral statute that says that whatever you owe in taxes is it for, for legal purposes is junior, is a junior, is junior to a reverse mortgage. So you can actually get a reverse mortgage and in addition defer your taxes. You can do both of these at the same time. Right? I should have mentioned regarding the state program. Um, you can also get one, you can get that loan modification of up to thirty thousand dollars, and also defer your taxes, right? So you can really, if you're Frank and Mary, you can do a lot about making your house safe and reducing the cost of keeping it.
If that's what your goal is, that's your primary goal. So that's about the house. What about keeping you able to stay in the house, even once you've got the house that's really terrific? What are the programs that are available? The first people to ask about that is Bay Path Elder Services. Bay Path Elder Services. They are the ones that can tell you um, all of the programs that can keep you at home. We've talked about some of those, and we're going to go through some of them. But the real bottom line is, if you're over 65, you just got to call these people because it's no charge to you. Pay Path Elder Services, they are the Aging Services Access Point, or ASAP, that covers this region. They cover Ashland. They are paid by the state and the federal government to tell you what programs are available and then to provide the programs. They actually came into existence um, as part of the Older Americans Act back in the 1960s which was the program that actually originally created Meals on Wheels. So that's what they were always known for. They still do Meals on Wheels. Um, they also do the Lifeline program. We're all aware of that program. If you want to stay home, especially if you're single, so if you fall down, there's no one there to talk to, right? You probably want to be part of Lifeline. You want to know you can press a button and, the, and somebody's going to show up. I, we just, my wife and I were just visiting her sister uh, who has seizures who was in her 70s, who had a seizure while we were visiting. She lives by herself in a condominium. If we hadn't been there, she would have been in big trouble. Big trouble. But by the way, she has Lifeline, she didn't have it on. Right? She would have been on the ground. She wasn't going to be calling anybody. Right? Lifeline is the little button that you have that is somewhere on you that you can press the button and then something good happens. Right? So, they have Lifeline. They'll also give you advice, as I was mentioning, on programs. In addition to that, even if you are not, I don't want to say death, even if you don't have serious disabilities, even if you don't need assistance regularly with the so-called activities of daily living, which we've talked about, which are uh, you know, dressing, eating, bathing, toileting, and transferring, getting around the house. If you just kind of need some help in order to manage around the house, like cooking a meal or getting the groceries, there is a state-funded program. These, once again, are amazingly your tax dollars at work. There are some good things about being in Massachusetts. Um, um, they will provide you with some amount of home care, some amount of someone coming in and helping you to do all of that stuff. Between 6 and 12 hours a week, depending on whether you are in the so-called basic program, because it doesn't appear that you need a lot of services, or ECOF. I have no idea what that stands for. It's a state thing, right? But it's ECOF. And it goes up to like 12 hours a week of programming. There is no asset test for this. There is an income-based copay. That's the chart. Oh boy, those are little numbers, aren't they? So, but if in your handout, you will find this chart so that you can figure out, based on your current income, what your copay would be. For Frank and Mary, it would be $101 per month. Now think about it. If you were getting home, if you were getting 12 hours of home care privately right now, the market for that is $20 to $25 an hour. I know I do a lot of this work, right? $20 an hour, if you were getting 12 hours a week times 4 is 48, but there's 4.3 weeks in a month. So figure it's 50 hours. 50 hours times 20 is $1,000. 50 hours times 25 is $1,250, right? You're, it, you can buy that for $101 a month. That's not a bad deal, right? Why? Because these folks want you to stay at home. They want you to stay at home. So, those are really important programs, and, and in, in terms of what you would be eligible for, what your copay would be, just call BayPet. They'll, they'll answer your questions over the phone, they'll come over to your house, they'll do what you want. If you need that kind of assistance, if you do need assistance with one or more of the activities of daily living, and in this case it can be just one, um, if you're in, a, in an assisted living facility, to qualify for this program, you need to be needing at least two activities of daily living assistance things. But it, at home, you only need assistance with one of the activities of daily living. Dressing, eating, bathing, toileting, transferring. And the, 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 the VA, being the VA, I mean, they're actually trying to help veterans, right? That's their point. They're very generous in terms of interpreting what an assistance is. The example that has been given to me is if you need, if you are having steak and you need someone to cut it up because you couldn't cut it up yourself and eat the steak, that's actually assistance with eating. Who knew? Who knew? So going back to what I had said earlier about these programs, don't say no to yourself. 
don't assume that you're not eligible for these programs. So to be eligible for the VA aid and attendance program, you have to have served or your husband or uh, if you're a widow, your, your, your living or dead husband has to still be your husband, you can't be divorced, right? Um, has to have served one day uh, during a period of war and has to have served a total of 90 active days. And one of those days has to be during a period of war. It doesn't have to have served overseas, right? And the most important thing I just want to emphasize is the dates. Um, when, uh, for their purposes, the World War II ended December 31st of 1946. Now, the bomb got dropped in August of 1945, right? For a lot of us, they kind of still remember that stuff. But the important date is this date, right? For their purposes, uh, Korea ended January 31st of 1955. Now, Eisenhower got elected in 52. I thought he ended the war the next year, right? But for their purposes, you still qualify if one day, I just had this, I just had this happen, right? I had somebody that joined the military in late 1954 and was astonished that he qualified, right? So be aware of those dates. You need, uh, there, there are, there are, some asset limits regarding the Veterans Aid and Attendance Program, but your house is not countable, right? And you can still give away assets and then qualify. There is not the five-year look-back period that there is um, in the so-called Mass Health Program. This rule may be getting changed, so you want to talk to somebody that does this before you, um, before you apply, right? But one thing, the main thing is don't turn, don't turn yourself down. Don't say no to yourself. Finally, to the extent that you have assets, oh, one other thing, on the asset limitation, there is a myth that there is a fixed asset limit and then it's $80,000. That is false. Um, you were allowed to keep those assets that would be necessary for you in order to continue to live using your current life, at your current lifestyle until you die. That, that calculation gets done differently for everyone. I'm gonna take all questions out. Um, and to the extent that you are over asset, you can always get under asset by buying an annuity, by taking some of the asset that you have and turning it into an income stream. Right? Any of those, uh, any of those strategies is available to you. If you are at home, you need assistance with one of the activities of daily living, and you're Frank and Mary, and Frank needs help. You you are entitled to a benefit of as much as sixteen hundred and forty-four dollars. If you're just Mary because Frank died. It's as much as $880 per month, and it could go, it could go forever. So these are a significant benefit. Um, finally, we're going to do a little Mass Health 101. Many of you have heard this before. I'm going to do a quick quiz. Here's Frank and Mary. There's their assets. If Mary needs nursing home care, does Frank need to spend down any money on the nursing home before he can qualify for Mass Health? How many think he has to spend down some of his money before Mary can qualify for Mass Health? Raise your hand. Ah, it's because I've been here before. Most of you know that you don't. You don't have to spend down anything. I actually went to Holliston for the first time about a month ago and did this presentation, and more than half the people there thought that, that these people that they were going to get killed because Mary was going to the nursing home. They just didn't know. So, and, but once again, one of the purposes of these presentations is not for a lot of the people whom I see here, whom I have seen before, but for the people at home who can't make it. You might not be aware of this. I'm still amazed how many people don't know this. So if Mary needs nursing home care, for her to qualify for Mass Health, which will then pay for the nursing home bills, she'll have to pay her Social Security, the $750 a month into the nursing home, but Mass Health will pay all the rest. For her to qualify, she has to have less than $2,000 in countable assets. And remember, they had quite a bit of assets. But Frank can own the house as long as the equity in the house is less than about $820,000, which covers pretty much everybody except, I said, I said that on, on Nantucket, and like nobody's house was less than $820,000. But for most folks, right, this pretty much takes care of the house. Um, Frank can't have more than $119,220 in other assets, in cash or cash equivalent assets. And clearly he would in this case. But he can have unlimited income. And so, the strategy in this case would be, if Mary was needing to stay in the nursing home, we would transfer all assets to Frank. Frank would then buy an annuity, take all of his assets above that magic number, and buy an annuity. As long as that annuity, an annuity is simply a promise by an insurance company to pay you money. As long as the annuity calls for monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy, 
and if he's 80, his life expectancy is about eight years, right? Um, the purchase of that annuity is a legitimate conversion from, from an asset to income. And the day after he buys the annuity, she can qualify for Mass Health. Mass Health will pay all the nursing home. There's no lien on any of these assets. There's no lien on the, ho on the house. There's no lien on the annuity payments, nothing. Finally, though, the only thing that Frank would probably want to do at that point, or even ahead of time if he was worried that he might die and that Mary might need to qualify for Mass Health, is he might want to change his will so that his will says that what, remember, his goal in the absence of this kind of worry, their will would be what everybody's will always used to be. When I die, I leave everything to my spouse, and after that, it goes to the kids. You don't want to go there if you're worried that your spouse may end up needing nursing home care because in that case, she's going to have all these assets and she's going to have to spend them down to qualify for NASA. So you want Frank's will to say, when I die, everything goes in trust for the benefit of my spouse. And then following her death, all the remainder can just get divided up among the kids. If Frank does it that way, and we make sure that Frank owns all the assets at the time of death because we've shifted them to him, and we make sure we and we and we are able to do that, by the way, because we make sure that Mary has a power of attorney, like now, so that she can do this at any time. Then, upon his death, all the assets would remain safe, and Mary would remain on mass health. The only problem that occurs is if Frank hasn't done that, and Mary then needs to qualify for mass health, then she's kind of stuck. We've talked about this before. If those were her assets, her only option at that point is to is or her only option if she wants to protect any of this is to transfer things out of her name, probably to her kids, to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., right? Uh, she, may want to, she may want to transfer them out of her name, and then she has to wait five years. There is a lot of, that, that's, the, that's what you hear about when you hear on the radio, oh, you gotta transfer everything to an irrevocable trust and wait five years. We no longer recommend that you do that, because a lot of those irrevocable trusts into which you immediately transfer assets are now getting challenged by NASA. And nothing has, they haven't succeeded yet in challenges, but you know, we can feel it coming. So we suggest that people really do transfer assets to their kids. Have the kids, to the extent they think it's appropriate, create a trust with that money, naming themselves as beneficiaries. Beyond that, this is 102, this isn't the advanced course, so beyond that, I don't want to go into details. A couple of other things. In general, I don't, I'm not a fan of long term care insurance. Uh, because it costs a lot, uh, and you probably can't buy enough to cover the bill. You know, the long-term care insurance right now, the, the, the best nursing home, um, in my opinion, St. Patrick's, it is wonderful. I think it's because it's the nuns. You know, the, the three great nursing homes that I've seen around here is St. Patrick's, Notre Dame du Lac, in Worcester, because it's the nuns, and there's a Jewish one in, in, in uh, Worcester. Jewish. I want to say Jewish families, I don't remember. It's on Salisbury Street. But they're all, they all run about $400 a day, right? So at $400 a day, you've got to buy a really big long-term care insurance policy, right? And, and if you're Frank and Mary, if one of you goes to the nursing home, you don't need the long-term care insurance because you're going to be able to shift all the assets. And as long as Frank has put everything into his name before he dies, um, then even after his death, Mary can still qualify, so she doesn't need long-term care insurance. Once again, if Mary is alone, if Mary is alone, then her options are much worse in terms of protecting things. She may want to have long-term care insurance. In that case, I want to just mention this one particular kind of policy. Um, if you own a long-term care insurance policy that will pay a minimum of $125 per day to the nursing home, for a minimum of two years, and you then go into the nursing home and apply for Mass Health, and tell them on the application that you do not intend to return home. Just say no. Say I do not intend to return home. Mass Health, the asset is become the house is non-countable. Mass Health cannot put a lien on it, and Mass Health cannot file a claim against it after you die. The effect of that little dinky long-term care insurance policy protects all the value of your home, no matter how much it's worth. This actually is very popular in Nantucket, <laughs> right? You could have a $3 million house. I just talked to this lady who they bought their house in the early 90s, downtown, $350,000, 1,200 square feet. Very cute. 
current assessed value, $2.3 million, right? And this is what she's worried about. She's got, you know, the, she, she's divorced, so she's got the house. She's got two kids who would love to be able to have the house. They always went, you know, they always went to Summers and Nantucket and stuff. Um, she doesn't have much else in assets, right? But she has one of these policies, right, that she got, you know, quite a few years ago. Um, the, the only other th the thing to remember about this policy, once you own it, if the policy was bought before 2013, there's a, there's a magic date in 2013, I don't remember. But if it was bought before then, you have to make sure that at the time you go into the nursing home, you still have two years worth of juice left on that policy, that the, that the policy will still pay two whole years. The reason why I say that is that many people now, their policies will also pay for home care. And that's why they buy them. Actually, when I talk to people about long-term care insurance, I tell them, ironically, it really isn't much use to you for the long-term care, for the nursing home, because the nursing home costs so much money. But a lot of times, it's good to have a benefit that will cover you while you're still at home, because you really, if you're Frank and Mary, you want to stay home. Well, if you have one, say, you, say that they had a two-year, say that Mary had a two-year policy. Say Frank's dead, and Mary's you know, now going to go to the nursing home. She has to spend on her cash. She's got this house left. She's hoping to save it. She's got this two-year policy. But she, act, but she used home care for one day. For one day while she was at home. They paid the home care worker $125. She then goes into the nursing home. The policy is useless. It no longer protects the house. So you have to be aware that the policy has to save for more than two years, and there still has to be two years left on it when, you're going, when you go into the nursing home. That rule no longer applies if you bought the policy after that date in 2013. The legislature finally, actually we all worked on this through the Elder Lawyers Association, leaned on the legislature, said this doesn't seem fair that people have to worry about this. So they actually changed the rule. And as to any policy bought after that date, um, even if you used the policy all the way down to just one day left for home care benefits, as long as the policy originally provided for two years worth of nursing home care, um, it's going to protect your house. One final thing about these policies. If you have one of those real old ones, right? These, they're, they're, you know, po these policies have been being written since like the 1980s. The $125 a day rule um, changed or went to 125 on March 15th of 1999. <clears throat> Prior to that, it was $50 a day, right? I just had this happen. You know, it's funny because, you know, these policies, people put them in a drawer. You know, they never think they're going to use them. Um, so I, I just had to talk to the, a, a person, a, this lady's son and daughter-in-law. And they had, and the mother had been at home. And then she just now has gone to the nursing home. And the only asset the mother has left is the house or the condo, which is worth a quarter of a million dollars and there's no mortgage. And so they came in and so they said, oh, you know, somebody told me to talk to you, you know, but... You know, I'm, I'm, we, you know, we, we, you know my, our mother's in the nursing home now, and we're just trying to figure, we don't think there's anything we can do about the condominium, right? Because the Mass Health is going to lean the condominium, because that's what they'll do. If you, you go to the nursing home, you say you intend to return home. Mass Health doesn't force you to sell the home, home but they put a lien on it to make sure they get repaid after your death. So, so she said, you know, we figure it's gone. And I said, so how old was that? And, and she said, we had this little dinky like you know, long-term care insurance policy, but that's not going to pay anything. It was like $60 a day. Right? So I said, how old is that policy? She said, well, what difference does that make? I said, how old is the policy? She pulled out the policy, and it was 1998. And I said, here's a great, I got, I got a great gift for you. The condo is safe, right? All you have to do is make sure when you file for, for Mass Health that you say on the form that you don't intend to return home. She, and I said, we'll take care of that when we do. She said, well, I already filed. I said, you already filed? You filled in the application? I said, she said, yeah. I said, well, what did you say? There was a little box, and it said, yes or no, do you intend to return home? She's like, nervous, I don't know, I don't know. She pulled out the policy. She had said yes, that it was her intention to return home. By doing that, if she got, if her mother got, if her mother-in-law got accepted, she was invalidating the usefulness of this policy. Right? So I then said to her, I said, so is your mom, has she been accepted yet? Have you got a notice? She was like, oh, I, no, we haven't gotten anything. So I said, what do we do now? So I said, well, what we're going to do is fill out a withdrawal of your mother-in-law's application right now, which we did. We sat there and filled it out 
when I drove to Tewksbury, which is the Mass Health office, and filed it and got a little date stamp on it, and then got up my courage and asked a caseworker to check the lady's name and see if she'd been approved yet. And she said no. She said, oh, the paperwork got backed up. She didn't get approved yet. So the, the condo ended up being safe. So we, because we withdrew the application, we refiled it, same application, but we checked off the box <coughs> no. And so the quarter million dollar condo is safe. So if, if, you're, if, you're, if you are in Frank and Mary's situation and you're saying to yourself, and this is not uncommon, people will say, well, you know, I want to keep control of my cash. And, you know, I, I figure I'm going to need to spend down my money. But I'd really like to give the kids the house, right? If that's the situation, this little policy can, can allow you to say, without anything else, that you can give the kids the house. Uh, finally, if you're, you know, if you're interested in seeing this again because you missed some of this, or if anybody else does, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, <laughs> Elder Law Frank and Mary, right? You can see any of these shows. Uh, and remember, the goal of all of this is peace of mind. So if this helps you, great. But you know, any of these programs, the point of this, as we all know, as we're getting older, the point of life as you get older is to sleep well at night. So hopefully, this helps you sleep well. Any questions? Any questions? I don't see any. If not, I'm happy to take one. Yes, sir. You haven't said anything about a line of credit as opposed to the first mortgage. Um, I did mention, I, because, and I mentioned, I said, many people will say to me, well, why don't I just get a line of credit from a bank instead of doing the reverse mortgage? And I'll tell them, I'll say, you know, the only issue with the line of credit, you know, first of all, you will find that an adjustable rate line of credit, the interest rate right now is almost exactly the same as the reverse mortgage. Did you see this? And secondly, on the line of credit, you got to make those payments every month, right? <laughs> and if you're Frank and Mary, you may want to make the payments if you can, um, especially if you've got a reverse mortgage because you don't want the reverse mortgage amount to grow. But if you can't, you know, if your bills, if stuff happens, you know, if you got, you know, you got extra medical bills or you need, you know, extra home care, if you can't. The nice thing about the reverse mortgage is you don't have to. So it's made, it's the same thing as getting a line of credit loan at the bank, except you never have to worry, oh, can I make that payment? And, and in terms of that, this goal, that to me is important, right? I want to know that I can sleep well at night. I don't have to think about that. If I want to make it, I can make it. So, But that's my reason. That's my reason. Yes, sir? On the VA uh, age attendance. Yep. Uh, there is a there is a Vietnam. Um, yes, I didn't include those dates. You may want to check with somebody on that, and I can give you a name of a person to talk to. By the way, one of the and, and, and I know that that it is it's some it's it's the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. It's the date of the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. So it's I want to say 1965 until 1973, I believe. Sometimes, but, but once again, just you can check with somebody, all right? Okay. Your yeah. veterans agent may know that, but also may not. The the thing the veterans agents for the towns are mostly trained in terms of knowing what the state benefits are to veterans, because they're paid by the state. They they often don't know some of these details on the federal. But if you email me, I can also send you information for somebody you can talk to about it. Okay. And the other thing is that thirty thousand. Yeah. The home Mark, modification program? Home modification. Yeah. Can you have that plus the reverse mortgage? Or? The question is, can you can you do the thirty thousand dollars plus the reverse mortgage? If you the answer to that one's no. You can do the reverse mortgage and the you can do the tax deferral and the home modification program. But you can't do the home modification and the I take that back. Now I'm thinking about a particular case. I think you could. You couldn't have the, the modification program first and then do the reverse mortgage. But it's my understanding you could do the reverse mortgage first and then do the modification program without it being without it triggering a default under the reverse mortgage. Because it seems like you could do the reverse mortgage for any reason, not knowing yep. you're going to be handicapped in the future. And at that time you might want to do the other program. That's right. I believe that's that, that I believe that, that is the case. But call smock. You know, mm -hmm. just give them a call. I mean, they're very interested. They love doing these. Because right? it's just a wonderful, I think it's really good. This is keeping people at home. You know? Okay? And as they say, it's like, unless you've got a lot of income, it's no, it's a zero interest loan. Uh, yes, sir. And then I'm, then I'm going to stop. Yes, sir. Oh, I, I try to qualify for a breast mortgage with Quicken. 
At my condo association, we'll not file the paperwork to qualify. So I'm locked out. The con you, you said you tried to qualify for a reverse mortgage and the condo association wouldn't file the paperwork. I have no idea why that is the case. Quick insight, it will tell you that you're not eligible because you're not qualified. That shows you all the other condo associations in the local areas that have qualified. Oh no, that's very interesting. No, I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that. If you, if you, you know, once again, you want to email me or get somebody to email me, and, and I'll look, I'll look at that because I've never heard of that before. That's why I love doing these. I always learn something from these presentations. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. And we'll see you in the fall. Thank you.